betting on a hydrogen-fueled future. That's what car companies like Hyundai and Toyota are doing despite sluggish sales. Hyundai says there's less competition and the hydrogen fuel cell design is scalable for small cars and bigger trucks and buses. But Hyundai has sold and leased just 373 fuel cell SUVs since beginning production in 2013. That falls short of its goal to sell or lease a thousand. Still, the company plans to invest 10 billion US dollars in eco-friendly technology, including hydrogen fuel cells, electric batteries, and hybrid cars. To boost sales, it recently slashed the price of the Tucson fuel cell from $134,000 U.S. dollars to $76,000 U.S. dollars. Meanwhile, Vancouver-based uh, Ballard Power is consolidating its business. Today, it bought fuel developer Protonex for $30 million. Telsa CEO and electric car company champion Elon Musk calls hydrogen technology a dead end. Slow sales and infrastructure challenges have many wondering whether hydrogen will become a viable alternative. Our E Squared panel today, Tom Rand, Senior Advisor at the Mars Clean Tech Venture Group, and Kenneth Green, Senior Director for Natural Resource Studies at the Fraser Institute. Welcome to you both. Let me start with you, Tom. Hydrogen is the future. Do you agree <laughs> or disagree? I think hydrogen has a role in the future. Okay. Um, I think it probably has a fairly limited role within the car sector. Right? I think Elon Musk may be right. I think batteries are far ahead of the fuel cells for cars. But it's got a place to play there. I think where it gets a little more interesting is when you scale up. So you go into buses and trucks and even trains. So in Germany, they have over 100 uh, hydrogen fuel powered trains on order. They're economic. Um, and even more interesting is when you scale up hydrogen to be a bridge between, for example, electricity and natural gas, where the utility Eon is taking uh, hydrogen produced by Canadian company Hydrogenics. They, they have electrolyzers, so you produce the hydrogen, fuel cells use it. But in the natural gas application, you're actually injecting it into the natural gas pipeline. So you're converting surplus wind energy, essentially, into a heating fuel. So there's lots of ways hydrogen plays. Cars are a piece of it, but the hydrogen economy is, is a niche part of a much larger and fast-moving sort of energy transition. Kenneth, your view. Well, we're going to actually both agree with Elon Musk this, this uh, segment. Um, I think that hydrogen uh, has a very, very limited role to play in transportation. I mean, the attraction is that it's a carbon-free, possibly carbon-free transportation source. Right now in the United States, 95% of it is made directly from methane, from natural gas, and therefore emits uh, CO2. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a really niche application. The fuel cell prices are not, not competitive with internal combustion at the small scale, uh, certainly. And there's no infrastructure. And this is one of the interesting things, which is the history of energy is the history of retasking existing infrastructure. And so having the previous infrastructure that could burn coal, for example, allowed you to burn oil and allows you to burn biofuels. And with, but, but you don't have a pre-existing infrastructure that really lets you move and contain what is a very, very... Um, flammable and explosive uh, and, and um, slippery um, uh, element, hydrogen. So, I, I, so there's lots of agreement between Ken and I today, uh, but I'll sort of go a little further. I, I agree with the idea that we want to leverage existing infrastructure, and I'll give you two ways in which hydrogen can do that. The first is, of course, this natural gas play. You can put easily between 5 and 10% of hydrogen into a natural gas pipeline, and you've now got clean, renewable natural gas. The other way to do it, which is interesting, and Europe, Europe is doing this now, where you need hydrogen to upgrade and make uh, gasoline, to refine uh, oil into gasoline, and you need hydrogen. And so the hydrogen can come from, again, renewable electricity sources. So what I think is interesting is the bigger picture where you say hydrogen will remain a niche. And I, I agree with Ken on that. But for a small country like Canada, if we have companies like Ballard or in particular Hydrogenics, who actually produce the hydrogen very efficiently, it's some of the best electrolyzers in the world, if they can get a piece of that niche market, it's actually big business for mm. us. I mean, this is tens of billions of dollars a year. It's, a, it's thousands of employees. And Hydrogenics is very critical in that piece. They've partnered with Eon. They have an investment from Enbridge. They're selling trains or fuel cells to all them for trains in mm. Germany. So certainly it's a niche play, but Canada's a tiny country, and if we get a part of that niche, it suddenly right. looks very big from an economic perspective. You're almost dismissive of Ballard. Are they not? We mentioned oh, no. their acquisition. What's their role? So the I'm not dismissive of Ballard at all. They've done many, many pivots. Uh, they've been around for a long time, and I think under their new CEO, uh, Randy McEwen, they're really beginning to consolidate and focus on what they think they can go after now. So Ballard is very good at building fuel cell stacks, whereas Hydrogenics is more of a generalized hydrogen plant where they can build fuel cells and they can make the hydrogen. So they're going to be going after slightly different markets, and I think there's a lot of synergies between those two companies. Kenneth, uh, 
that, that's the view from the company level. What about from the government level? The Liberals coming out saying that they plan to invest in clean tech. What's the best way for government to be involved, do you think? Well, it's funny because I was writing about this in 2004 when Ballard was reporting that they were right around the corner with economically competitive fuel cells and when the Governor Schwarzenegger was announcing hydrogen highways hmm. and we still saw virtually nothing of it. Um, the government's best role, as far as I'm concerned, with regard to the energy space, is really supporting fundamental R&D. We're hitting up against fundamental limits, limits in physics, chemistry, electrochemistry, and so forth on the energy frontier. And that basic research is where resources need to be developed and, or directed, not toward applied research, not toward trying to shepherd chosen favorite technologies across the valley of death, um, but actually trying to get breakthroughs and advances that will let us generate renewable or, or cleaner energy more affordably uh, and at scale. I think that's the key, right. the key role for government. So there's probably a point of disagreement here, and Ken and I have discussed this before, but let me, so the valley of death is significant, right? So I agree with him about fundamental research. Of course, the government should play there, but the valley of death is no joke, and, and none of the industries that we rely on for economic activity today, from nuclear, aerospace, the internet, automotive, none of those came about without strategic government support on helping m ensure there was sufficient demand to bring prices down. I mean, even right now, EDC has lent $500 million for a Volkswagen factory in Mexico, which is presumably designed to, to have demand for Canadian auto parts. I'm afraid I have, I to, disagree. I'm so afraid I have to disagree no, with that, Tom. It, it's, uh, the natural gas market developed in markets without uh, planning or without government support. Edison, of course, developed the first electric generator without government planning and government support. Um, the, the, if something is really ready for market, it will find market. Well, and if it's not ready for market, okay. no amount of well, no, no, trying no, no, to limp hey, across hey, the valley of death is going to get it there. So there's, there's, there's a sophisticated discussion to be had here. The point I'm making is, in automotive, for example, there was an enormous amount of political and diplomatic goodwill behind building, for example, the auto pact. There's an enormous amount of infrastructure built called the interstate highway system. So there can be small exceptions to the rule, but there are exceptions to the rule for a reason. In general, large industries have always had strategic support from governments, right? So, uh, you know, it, where we would overlap, I think, Ken and I, is fracking, for example. Fracking was a, a government-backed uh, technology that developed over a long period of time. It took the private sector to take it to market. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt the power of the private sector. I operate in the private sector. But to think that the market is so simple, that all you do is feed it R&D, and then it takes over, I think is too simplistic a notion. I wish we had more time. Guys, thanks so very much for joining us today. We appreciate it.